Good day, Brigade. This is Bobby coming at you again with another episode of our podcast here. Today we're going to be going over some criticisms of the current administration in the interest of trying to, you know, balance things out a little bit. Because at this point, A, we've already said that we're going to be, you know, criticizing this administration at least as much. And... By criticize, we mean more on the accuracy of critique, you know, actual traditional criticism. But we really haven't felt like we've done that enough. At least throughout our posts and our podcast episodes. So today is kind of an episode largely dedicated to that. And if you think we're favoring them or gonna go light, (laughs) think again. Because no. In spite what you might think, Like we've said previously, we are neither Republican nor Democrat. We do not choose to affiliate with a political party in the United States, as we currently do not believe any active political party really clearly represents our interests enough. Actually, if we're being totally honest, it's probably the Solidarity Party of anyone we'd go with, but they have more right-wing economic inclinations, and we're kind of just eh about that. Plus, there's this whole Christianity thing, as we discussed in our previous episode, in which we cover distributism. If you haven't checked that out, please do. Anyway, (laughs) on to what we're going to be talking about, and before we get to that, a fact. Did you know that Walt Disney moved his focus from animation to amusement parks after a falling out with his animation department due to a strike that started after the release of Snow White? If you want to know more on that, I'd recommend watching a Defunct Land episode, its channel on YouTube, called The Craziest Party Walt Disney Ever Threw. Because, whew! Like, if you think you know Disney, watch that. Then you'll realize you don't really know Disney. Anyways, on with the show. All right, so as we said in our intro here, we're going to be doing some criticisms of the current administration here. And to start, we're going to be going with our number one biggest gripe by far. Leaving many of the America First trade policies in place, and they have resulted in serious supply issues and increasing inflation in prices. Now keep in mind, this is not the sole factor We just believe it's a very strong contributing factor that needs to be addressed. Now, what kind of America First policies are we talking about? We're talking about protectionism. We're talking about the idea of pulling out of trade trade deals we don't like because we didn't find them 100% profitable. Now, you might be wondering why I say profitable instead of beneficial. And there's a reason to that. The reason is that a lot of these trade deals weren't set in place necessarily to deal with gaining economic boosts, but rather to gain strategic allies. Our biggest and top example, which we're going to be discussing, trust me, this is the one we're talking about right now, is trade deals with China and the trade deal we had with China versus the trade deal we have with China. So, a little bit of history. Way back in the 60s, China and the Soviet Union had a bit of a falling out. It's commonly referred to as the Sino-Soviet split, because that's exactly what happened. Anyways, the Soviets decided to continue along their more traditional Marxist-Leninist path, whereas the Sorry, the Chinese, I was about to say the Sino, which doesn't make any goddamn sense. Anyway, and the Chinese decided to go along their more traditional Maoist path which kind of lend into a weird, different, but somewhat same Leninism. As it such, Richard, President Richard Nixon saw himself an opportunity. So if the, if the Chinese and the Soviets were split between this, why don't we go make China our ally? Keep in mind that China wasn't the only one who actually had a disagreement at this point. In fact, there were two other nations that actually sided with China in the Warsaw Pact Soviet Eastern Bloc. And that, and that was Albania, run by Enver Hoxha, 
who believed that the Soviet administration after Stalin was going too soft. Trust me, this guy was crazy hardcore. Look up Enver Hoha, and you'll have a you'll have an interesting story for the day. <laughs> and the other was the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia with Joseph Tito. Now, Tito's a fascinating man, and we're going to cover him in a, level, in a later episode. And honestly, kind of just a little history on the, so, on the Socialist Federated Republic, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia anyway, because... My God, someone actually united the Balkans for more than 10 years. But going back to this, now we will give the administration that as of yesterday, they did remove tariffs on many electronic computer com components coming from China. And as a result, this should lead to a wider availability of computers and similar electronics with a lower cost overall, not only electronic components, don't expect like a massive price drop though, but it's gonna be a great start to help start bringing that down a little bit. It's kind of an interesting way to do this. So what can we do as an alternative? Well, right now, as it currently stands, we can't really reduce military funding to help deal with the America first policies that were idiotically left in place. God only knows, well, many believe the reason that the current administration actually left these America first policies in place was because of the huge reduction of tax revenue due to the shifting of the taxation system and all that fun jazz. But regardless, in our opinion, there was no reason to maintain these policies as the United States had plenty of other options back then for doing other things. Now, it might be that it was the plan of Putin all along to wait until the Americans decided to shift some of their defense spending away, but... <laughs> We'd sooner burn our schools than, give, than stop giving money to the military. I mean, my God, do you know America? <laughs> anyway... <laughs> there are some other things we can do, like... If we were to increase spending into the military, it would just probably make things worse. If Putin were to catch word, it would probably just make him angrier. And as of current, it looks like we might actually start be heading, start heading towards a situation where we can get Putin to get out of Ukraine here. Again, we're still hoping that it happens by May, because there are definitely some things going crazy with Putin. But please, look this stuff up, because as of current events, the administration has talked with Zelensky... And they have talked about a lot of what's going on, a lot of things that are happening. And initial declassified intelligence reports are showing that Putin's advisors and such are likely lying to him about the situation, and Putin's catching on. So Putin is likely to recognize his blunder within the next coming weeks and try to seek a peace deal that might be amicable for both sides. As it stands, it's looking very likely Ukraine might become a neutral nation. Sorry we veered off track, but this does tie in, we do promise. <laughs> Anyways, since we can't really increase spending without increasing tensions, we should prioritize putting any extra money we might have towards a combination of education, trade proposals for reopening our trade network more, and promoting all sorts of energy acquisition abilities. Why? So that we can stop relying on overall grand supply of oil and start making a steady shift away from fossil fuels, which even in the best case, we can't run on forever. And to start working to rebuild relations with China, which the many America First policies that are left in place put a big frickin' wall in the way of. Plus, instead of, you know, Having the current administration that wants to increase military spending because of this particular situation, we can de-escalate this situation and remove the need for the military spending to increase. See? Told you the Ukraine thing would tie on back. So, what is our second gripe? Now, as we were talking about the environment a little bit there, we're actually going to be talking about it a bit more. Another recent thing that the administration has done that we think is like, What are you 
thinking? And this one might actually surprise you a little bit, is the mass investment into carbon capture technologies in spite of the debatable effectiveness of it. And we're not saying like debatable like, oh, it's debatable, but not really debatable. Like there's clearly one side that makes sense and the other's just bitching about it. We mean like there is an actual debate because there is not sufficient enough information quite yet. And actually doing a little bit of the research into this, I can see why it's a really debatable topic. Anyways, the mass investment into this carbon capture and the eminent domain claims that are happening as a result that are actually screwing a lot of farmers out of their farmland. As we go, as we go forward, we're going to talk a little bit about this carbon capture. So carbon capture basically is the idea of taking CO2 large producers like coal plants, biomass plants, and things like that, and taking that carbon and storing it in a geological future for a long time. Long-term storage on this technology has yet to actually ever be attempted. Keep this in mind. So where does this tech come from? It actually gets derived from enhanced oil recovery methods that use CO2 and things like that to finish off what little left they can get out of an oil reserve. So this technology does exist, but not for the reason you might think. It actually was used initially to recover oil from the ground. Often the method that we would be using for the carbon capture technology and that's currently being used around the world for carbon capture technology in order to make it more cost effective because a big problem with this is cost because who the hell wants CO2 is combine this carbon capture pro anyways combining the carbon capture process sorry with the utilization of the CO2 that you're capturing in order to offset the cost of the carbon capture process itself by putting the CO2 towards using it for other things. Now, this could be used for, like, building up industry stuff, like, you know, as we just stated for earlier, extracting excess little bit oil through the oil enhanced, enhanced oil <laughs> in irrigation techniques. Sorry, my mouth's a bit bit today. <laughs> and... If you want to know how much that's being used currently, about one one thousandth of all global CO2 emissions are currently being taken into a carbon capture method of some kind. Right now, carbon capture is largely relegated to the industrial sector because it was mostly a plan, strategy, see what we can do with it kind of deal. In fact, a lot of it makes an interesting situation. So, why many farmers have joined with these environmental groups is part of the debate in itself. The farmers don't really want to lose their land to eminent domain, especially on a technology that doesn't actually have proof that it works. So, what are some of the problems with carbon capture? Well, the biggest one by far is the fear that it might CO2 could easily leak out of these geological features, or out of these large storage units, whichever gets used. And with a gas, Preventing leaks is a very difficult thing. Not impossible, but difficult. Especially if you're trying to use, like, natural ground. Another issue comes when, well, when humans are gone, or even the nation state that build the carbon capture technology might potentially fall, I'm not trying to say anything, is that when this happens, will that carbon capture be set in place? Will it continue to operate? Will it eventually be left to decay, or will it be deliberately destroyed? And if that's the case, what happens to the CO2 that's been captured? Well, it would likely, most likely, just go back into the air in a mass in a mass boom. Not like an actual physical boom, but more like just a huge amount of it at once. So farmers and environmentalists have largely joined together to fight this carbon capture method because the mass investment into it and largely towards large corporations and coal corporations and, you know, other fossil fuel industries. And for example of this, we can actually cite something that has been tried in the American Union. There's a project known as the Future Gen Project, which was to try to push for the idea of quote-unquote clean coal. If you're an American and watch TV around the early 2010s, you know exactly what I mean by clean coal. Seeing those advertisements with the electrical outlet and the coal brick and all that, yeah. It, it, it's weird. Well, anyways, what is clean coal? 
Essentially, it's coal with zero net carbon emissions. And the idea was to try to take these carbon capture methods and experiment with using it with extraction methods in tandem with trying to reduce the overall carbon output of the coal being used for producing electricity. Now, you might be wondering what happened here. Did it work? No. No, it did not. Not even close. And honestly, the fact that it teamed up with major coal corporations and things like that probably didn't help you in the bit slightest. But this is kind of the problem, and many environmentalists and such who disagree with the carbon capture method cite that doing this through industries like this would only encourage a perpetual use of fossil fuels, which, as we discussed previously due to the idea of finite supply and most fossil fuels being non-renewable resources, would have to end eventually. So, the idea of using carbon capture on like coal and oil and all that is very debatable on whether or not it would fully work. Tests show that it has a somewhat workable effect, but again, we don't have enough information on this to really know. Well, simultaneously, we probably shouldn't be taking farmers' land and digging and investing a shit ton of money towards something we're uncertain on. And that's the argument here, is why are we spending so much money in helping corporations of coal producers and such on producing carbon capture technologies we're not even certain work? It's a bit of an issue, and quite frankly, arguably, a waste of money. Does the administration need to be doing this? No. Why are they doing this? I guess to make it look like they care about going green or something? Uh, I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense. So our third gripe, and our final gripe for the day, is probably one you're going to be more familiar with. And that is President Biden's recent comments that were made in Warsaw. Specifically the quote, For God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Now you're probably wondering, okay, it's an interesting statement, and it does have a powerful boom, but what exactly are we not liking about it? What are we not liking about it? It would be the rhetorical strategy being employed here. See, by saying, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power, it's kind of insinuating that you might do something to remove said man from power. And that's how the Russians chose to respond to it. And understandably so. Not only that, but it seems to have only raised tensions more than anything. Now we'd like to point out that there were some interesting notes on people who made commentary after this that we'd like to actually consider now. For example, we read in the CNN story that a defense official from the Baltic country... Yes. It was that vague of an actual reference. I'm guessing it was for the sake of anonymity, but my god... I'm not even joking, that was actually what it was said in the story, is a defense official from a Baltic country was pleased to hear Biden's comments. What he said was, quote, The West should not be afraid to be ambiguous because of the ambiguity of the phrase, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. It implies you might be doing something, but it also expresses you don't want to. Or expresses more rather not that you don't want to, but expresses that something will be done, or hopefully gets done. Well, anyways, the guy says, you two, we shouldn't, the West shouldn't be afraid to be ambiguous. It have, would have given some, in Russia, hope in that the regime can change. Sorry, I had to read that directly. It was, ugh. And I don't know if it's necessarily giving ru people in Russia hope in that some change can happen, Especially when you consider what Russia's been doing for the past almost decade. Probably even more than that, if I'm thinking correctly. Because whether or not you may or may not know this because of Russian media censorship, and every nation state censors media to a degree, it is not exclusive to any one group. Disclaimer. Well, anywho, it kind of makes an interesting point. 
The ambiguity idea within rhetoric can be a very effective tool, especially when making it seem like you might do something, but you might not. In fact, Putin himself has been using this strategy for decades, for as long as he's been in power, possibly longer. So we're gonna say decades. So, is this a really a thing that gives people in Russia hope? Well, probably no more hope than they had yesterday of overthrowing Putin. I mean, it definitely makes them feel glad that the West is actually looking at them and making sure, hey, we might consider doing something if we can figure out how. And that might give some hope to some major opposition groups. But the heart of it is the Russian people are fighting and they have been fighting for decades. They know they don't want, don't want this. They don't necessarily want a ch they don't necessarily want a complete overhaul, but they know they don't want Putin in his system. There are many who still support Putin, but there are also many more out there that oppose him, especially in Russia. So, what did Macron have to say? Our goal is to stop the war in Russia launched in Ukraine while avoiding a war in escalation. Adding that... Well, didn't add. This kind of suggests that Macron felt this unhelpful, not useful, kind of counterproductive to the idea of trying to negotiate peace. And that's actually an understandable concern, especially when you give in that if this were to escalate into a greater European <laughs> conflict, France would, for a third time, in terms of defining world wars, making them three for three, be a part of the front of another global war. It's interesting how to note that this current form of globalization actually, in general, set up largely by the American Union after World War II, that it seems necessary to try and spread the geopolitical and economic focuses of the world. Sorry, I just skipped ahead in my own sentence there. It's interesting to note how the current form of globalization still puts a very heavy focus on Europe and how it's always seen as the main geopolitical focus. Which is really fascinating because you could argue that the imperialist system never really died, just changed to fit a more modern perspective in time. It would actually probably be necessary in the future for an alternate form of globalization to try and spread both the geopolitical and economic focuses of the world to other regions and try to decentralize the general idea. Try to give the idea that we're all kind of a valued part of this planet. Not only that, but it would also limit the overall influence of European, including American, politics and economics and bolster the influence of ideas that spread out the focus like an extended free trade network and cooperative economic ideas like we always talk about to enrich and boost the prosperity of those nation states. In fact, we believe personally that Asia would be a very good start for an economic focus shift as trade and economic booms have been occurring in the region like wildfire. Like seriously, they've had some financial crises like the 1996 financial crisis, but overall they've been pretty much on the rise. And two major nations in particular are actually part of the BRIC economies which are large emerging or emerging economies that may grow large and powerful within the next 20 years. These two being China and India. So it wouldn't be a difficult thing to do at all. And in fact, might be beneficial to shift the economic focus towards somewhere like the Asian continent, especially towards the Asian coast, where you have economies like South Korea and Japan, which are incredibly powerful right now having a more center stage role on the trade, on the global trade network. By developing this Pacific trade network too, the whole world could also benefit because we more or less try to recreate the Silk Road but incorporate more Western elements. Now it should be noted that Xi Jinping seems to have a very strong focus on recreating the Silk Road. The thing is, between some nations being uneasy about it, their trouble with the the trouble with them trying to basically commit a cultural genocide on the Uyghur and America showing basically no interest. This kind of leaves China in a weird situation with that. 
So, like, it is still possible, and they still are definitely focusing hard on it, but it wouldn't be as strong as it could be, say, if you had the entire world to back it up. Or even had the Western world want to back it up. Additionally, when we go back to our cooperative economics idea, it could prove to be, it's already proving to be effective in many, many African nations. In fact, a lot of fair, fair trade initiatives have proposed using cooperative economics, especially within developing nations and such. Developing with quotes around it, because define development. And could even help benefit the local economy immensely by empowering the individual people to produce and control the goods of their respective communities. And this has had a very pronounced effect. Now the fair trade initiatives are good, but they still face some problems, mostly like actual protective tariffs. In this case, these are tariffs actually designed for trying to protect the industry of other nations. The problem with that is, you're literally just imposing what you think is a friendly embargo on that nation. Well, not even a embargo, a taxation of that nation. Which, how does that help? You're making their things harder to acquire and giving them fewer options for their own domestic markets. How does that help? Anyway, that notwithstanding, fair trade initiatives have had an interesting effect, but if we were to open it up to a full free trade initiative and eliminate the principle of tariffs, we could have essentially unrestricted trade and potentially unrestricted trade on a global scale. If that were to occur, we'd face immense boons, both economically and socially. However, it should be important to note that there are some very good reasons why there are trade sanctions, embargoes, and all that kind of stuff, and why unrestricted total, total unrestricted free trade is currently a fever dream. As much as we'd like to make it so, it's still problematic. And that's because a lot of nation states have some disagreements and disputes, arguments, and some are completely justified in their actions, so let's keep that in mind and put these tariffs and such as a form of retaliation. However, we'd like to point out there's also a problem with this one. Because if you were to do something like that, it's not impossible for that nation state to say, go to a competitor of the nation state it was previously trading with, and acquire the things that they were trying to acquire initially. In fact, we've recently seen this with the sanctions imposed on Russia. I'm not criticizing them negatively because they have been helping and it has been doing a lot of harm has been doing a lot to make the Russian people want Putin to stop this war to save the Russian economy. And part of why it's working is because we have such a strong, large economic alliance that wants to put forth the effort. The problem is, you also have nation states that can skirt these things, like the People's Republic of China, for example. Now, they've been kind of more on the down low and kind of hesitant lately, but they still have been providing some things to Russia. Now, why is this a problem? Well, you know how it's nice to have a wall that you can use to surround your enemies and kind of just create a sort of close-in pincer idea? This would be the idea on an economic scale or on an economic concept, but when you have little perforations slipping through, it's kind of like having a hole in your blockade. Your encirclement's gonna fail, because there's a way out. It's not a great way, but it's a way. And this is kind of the problematic issue of trying to use tariffs and sanctions, especially when it comes to more controversial things. Now, the Russian thing was pretty well universally condemned. Most of the world was like, no, that's not cool, we gotta punish you. But. This isn't always and often not the case. And it's kind of why such things are problematic. And while an unrestricted free trade system wouldn't make this possible, it would at very least provide a much greater economic prosperity to the world. Anyways, those are all the large criticisms on the administration. And quite frankly, we could go on with others because there are plenty of others. And... 
To be fair, we've had worse presidents. By far, we've had worse presidents. And I'm not even talking his immediate predecessor. But, and keep this in mind, not every action or result of an action bears fruit immediately. Sometimes it takes a while. And sometimes it takes a series of calamities and fuck-ups in order to bring those things about. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people who can seriously fuck up. But that doesn't mean you should stick with those fuck-ups. And this is our last little thing. We plead. End all America First protectionist trade policies. Try to get back in good graces with China. If for no other reason than to make it harder on Russia. Anyways, that's our show. Thank you for listening if you made it to this point. If you like us, share us. If you hate us, share us. If you're not sure what to think about us, yeah, share us anyway. Maybe get a second opinion. Anyway, thanks for listening. And those who wish not to be tread on should mind where they step.